Well, hello everyone and welcome along to this special harvest programme that we've put together to be distributed with these afternoon tea boxes. And uh, as you can see, I'm joined here today by Dora because the last time I was in seeing some of you folk who I haven't seen perhaps for a while, you were asking how she is and you'd seen her in some of the children's videos and you'd said, when are we going to get to see Dora again? Well, here she is. And we got Dora just a couple of weeks before the first lockdown. And she was just a little pup, not much larger than the span of my finger and thumb here now. And as you can see that in almost two years, she has grown, she's got longer. Um, her uh, hair has grown longer. Um, she's got a bark now that you might hear at some stage before I set her down. And there's been lots of change. And as we enter the season of harvest, we're reminded of lots of change. We're reminded of how the seasons change, how the leaves and the trees will begin to change colour and how the fruit and the, the vegetables will begin to be harvested and the ground will change. And as it prepares itself for winter, there's just lots of change. And no doubt you've experienced lots of change over these past two years. Um, some of you perhaps haven't even perhaps been to church here in the building. I know you've been watching online. Some of you have been listening on the CDs and the DVDs. And it's been a long time since you've been able to sit in your usual seat and worship the way you would have done normally. And there has been lots of change. But we want to use this little CD, this little DVD, this little afternoon tea box as a way of connecting with you again of reminding you of the God of harvest and the fact that we are still here and we still care for you, even though it might be a while since we've seen you. So we're going to just have a, a small uh, opening prayer and then I'll say a little bit about what's going to happen later on in the desk. So let's just pray together just now. Our Father, we thank you for harvest time we thank you, Lord, for the farming community. We thank you, Lord, for people who ensure we have food on our tables. Lord, this is a time of thanksgiving. And Lord, how can we not be a thankful people when we think of how we've come through COVID and come through all that we've come through these past number of months, lockdowns and isolation and everything that has come along with that. We just do pray, Lord, that as we have a small program now and as people enjoy some homemade vegetable soup and wheat and bread and apple crumble and carrot cake and the like, as they're reminded of the good things which fill their stomachs, might they be all the more thankful for Jesus, the ultimate gift, the best gift given to us by you yourself, O Lord. You are the giving God and harvest reminds us of that bless all that we're about to receive to our bodily use and all of the hands that have prepared it and help us to enjoy as we listen and as we enjoy together all for jesus sake amen well there's going to be a few videos now i'm grateful to some folk who have recorded themselves singing some items of praise and hopefully along with this disc you've received a little afternoon tea box where there are some treats for you to enjoy please do um, listen along to the CD as you enjoy those things. And so I'm grateful to the folk who are now going to lead us in the items of praise and the songs and the music that have been recorded. And also I'm grateful to Johnny who has recorded a little update on the shoebox appeal because at this time we normally give our shoeboxes. Now you might think to yourself it's a bit strange to be giving gifts for Christmas time, but those have to go and be sorted and sent to the different countries that they go to. So isn't it, isn't it nice that at harvest time when we think about receiving, we also give. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Oh, 
every strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you were teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten I just wanted to take a few minutes to tell you about Operation Christmas Child. Operation Christmas Child is a project run by the Samaritan's Purse, which involves sending personally packed shoebox gifts to children across the world who are less well off than ourselves, and who perhaps have never had the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel. Their goal is to show the love of God tangibly to children all across the world, and through partnership with local churches to give these children the even greater gift of the gospel that they might come to put their trust in Jesus. Operation Christmas Child began in the UK in 1990 after David Cook, a local businessman in Wrexham, and his wife Jill felt called to do something in response to the plight of Romanian orphans at the end of the Cold War. Dave's sister Jan came up with the idea 
of packing a shoebox full of gifts and following a local radio appeal, the community were able to raise enough gifts to fill seven lorries for Romania. Since 1990, over 178 million children in more than 150 countries across the world have received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. So you can see that this project globally has had a monumental impact. In addition to receiving the shoebox of gifts, many of the children are also given the opportunity of participating in the Greatest Journey training course. This involves trained volunteers from local churches delivering a series of 12 Bible lessons focusing on Jesus and how they can find forgiveness through faith in him. These courses then finish with a celebration where children receive a certificate for completing the course and many of them also receive their own copy of the Bible. As you may know, for the last few years, First Dramara has sought to support this project by packing shoeboxes for the Operation Christmas Child Appeal. The shoeboxes are, shoeboxes are collected on Harvest Sunday each year. Harvest is a season in the church calendar where we give thanks to God for his gracious provision of all that we need throughout each year. But as we thank God for the abundance we have, it's good to share some of our abundance with those who are less fortunate than ourselves. For those of you who've participated in Operation Christmas Child Appeal this year, can I sincerely thank you um, for your support in this eternal cause. Thank you for the time and effort that you've put into making this Christmas special for a little boy or girl across the world less fortunate than ourselves. In closing this harvest season, can I encourage all of you to remember the work of Samaritan's Purse and particularly Operation Christmas Child. Can I ask that you would pray that this Christmas, as millions of children receive a shoebox as a tangible expression of God's love for them, that they would respond by trusting in him and coming to love, them, love him as their saviour and king. Thank you. I am weak I know we 
His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save faithful in love? My debt is paid, and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to in love my debt is paid and the victory won the Lord is my salvation glory be to God the Father glory be to God the Son Glory be to God, the Spirit, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is our salvation. I uh, was chatting to one or two of you and you were telling me about some of the programs that you enjoy watching on the TV and particularly some of those programs that you 
perhaps began to follow over the lockdown. And some of those programmes all revolved around the subject of antiques. Some of you enjoy the Antiques Roadshow. For some of you, it's Flog It. And for others, it's Cash in the Attic. And on those programmes, I know how you like to not only look to see something make a lot of money, but isn't it always good whenever you see something appear on the Antiques Roadshow and it looks vaguely familiar and you think to yourself, I might have one of those up the stairs and then you realise that it goes for a staggering amount of money and then you realise it's time you went up the stairs and you opened the trap door on the attic and you had a good rummage around to see if actually you still have that um, very precious item. But I remember whenever I was a, a little boy, my grandmother used to look after a lady called Margaret. And Margaret died only a couple of years ago. And when she died, she was in her late 90s. And so Margaret was one of those people <clears throat> who, for my entire life, was just always an old lady. And she lived in a house that had lots and lots of Victorian things in it. And that would have spanned not only from the lights and the ceiling, but even to the very biscuit tins that she would have given you a biscuit out of. Uh, most of the things were pre-World War II anyway. Um, I remember seeing oil lamps and gas masks and those type of things in her house. And I'm going to put a picture up on the screen just now because Margaret had a house where the fire was lit all of the time. It was a house that didn't have oil heating or gas. The only form of heat and the only form of hot water was whenever the fire was lit. And some of you might remember that. And so I want you to imagine going into a, a, a sitting room, a small sitting room, and there's a fire always roaring, and there's a mantelpiece. And on the mantelpiece are these two dogs, matching dogs, identical dogs. And maybe you have a set of these dogs, maybe you've seen a set of these dogs, but I remember these dogs sat on either side of the mantelpiece in Margaret's house. And my father happened to one day be watching the Antiques Road show. And a very unique and very old set of these identical dogs made a clean fortune. And Margaret said to my dad one day, is there anything in my house that you would like to remember me by? And my dad said, yes, I'd like the two dogs. So no doubt, my dad was thinking they're valuable. They're worth a lot of money. Well, when Margaret died, my father inherited these two dogs. And no doubt my father already had the money spent from these two dogs. He already had the luxury yacht bought. He already had the worldwide cruise, or he already had the extension built on the house, or whatever he was going to do with the money, he already had it spent. And he took the two dogs to a, an antique dealer in Ballymena, and he turned them upside down, looked and there was no stamp, there was no authentic name. There was no great renowned make. And he was told the dogs were pretty much worth zilch. Absolutely nothing. But in Margaret's house also hung this. And I happened to inherit this. This hung above the fireplace. And so it has... Years and years and years of smoke and soot from that fire. And it's a pencil drawing. And it's dated, it has the author's name here, and it's dated December 1897. Now, this is probably the oldest thing that I have in my house, or at least it's one of the oldest things. 1897. So it's Victorian. It's extremely old, but it's a picture 
of Ruth from the Bible. And I used to sit and look up at this picture, and Margaret used to always say, yes, that is Ruth from the Bible. And when we think about the story of Ruth, and when we think about harvest time, I want to read a couple of verses from the book of Ruth in Scripture. Ruth chapter 2 says this, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favour. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field, and after the reapers... And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. The Lord, sorry, then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the fields that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bound to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favour in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land, and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law of whom she had worked and said, the man's name of whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, Keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young woman, lest another in another field you might be assaulted. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she continued to live with her mother-in-law. Amen. So we have here Ruth, who we've had a look at in our picture, and I'm not sure if we know the story or not, but Naomi and Elimelech, they live in Bethlehem, there's famine in the land of Bethlehem, which is ironic because Bethlehem means the house of bread. So Bethlehem is undergoing judgment. Um, it's interesting that uh, one of the last things we read in the book of Judges is in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone 
did what was right in his own eyes. So there was people living for themselves. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So you had lots and lots of different views, people living for themselves. And now all of a sudden, there's judgment brought upon Bethlehem. And Elimelech and Naomi decide to go to the land of Moab, where they're forbidden to go to. They take their sons, Machlon and Kilion, and they marry Moabitesses, Ruth and Orpah. All of the men die. Naomi decides, when she hears there's bread again in the house of bread, when she hears that there's food again in Bethlehem, she returns. Orpah says, no, I'm not going to come. Ruth says, I'm going to come with you. I will leave my people. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. They arrive in Bethlehem. They arrive in Israel. And of course, Ruth has no position. She has no food. She is poor. She has nothing. And this is where we're introduced to the character of Boaz. In the midst of the wheat and the barley harvests, God provides for Ruth. He provides for Naomi. He provides for their family. Notice that they're given water to drink, fresh water. The men draw it for them. They don't even have to draw it themselves. They're told that they can glean in the fields. In fact, they're not only told they can glean in the fields, actually, the farmers leave some for them. Indeed, even the farmers tell her, actually, just take some of the stalks of grain before we get to them. They're fed. They're refreshed. They're satisfied. Indeed, even in Old Testament law, if you lost your husband, another member of the family would step in and marry you, and that way the name can carry on. And that's called a Goel Redeemer, a kinsman Redeemer. And that's what we see God providing Rift with here. Food, shelter, clothing, possession, prosperity, everything that she needed. Surely, as we sit today, as we eat, and as we drink, and as we listen, aren't we mindful that God is a good God, a giving God. He's been with us throughout COVID. He has provided, and even this season of harvest reminds us that he continues to do so. God is good. He gives, and he continues to give. Yes, he gives food, physical food. But he also gives spiritually, doesn't he, this, this, this afternoon. Let's go back to our picture. Here we have the picture here of Ruth. I want you to imagine a luxurious house. A few weeks ago, a picture's going to appear on the screen. A few weeks ago, Lorna and I had the opportunity of traveling to Highclere Castle, where Downton Abbey is filmed. And you walk through the door where, I was going to say where Lord and Lady Grantham, but the real, I suppose I should say, Lord and Lady Canaveron, where they sit and where they read and where they eat and where they walk. And when you walk through the door, there's mahogany staircases. There's luxurious upholstery in the windows and uh, on the walls and on the chairs. There is a library with books dating back to the 15 and 1600s. First editions. Silverware, sin silver candelabras, crystal chandeliers, fine bone china, grandfather clocks. You name it, in that big house. Well, a big house, just like Highclere Castle, the elderly baron has just died. And word has gone out into all of the local estate agents, into all of the papers, on the internet, that the baronry is up for sale. The manor house is for sale. Come, all you who will, 
all of you antique dealers, all of you fine bone china collectors, all of you art aficionados, come to this great big fancy house and you will be absolutely mesmerized with the merchandise that's on offer. There is exquisite artwork. There's beautiful, fine uh, mahogany furniture. Whatever you, as an antique dealer, or a collector of Victorian furniture, or a purveyor of um, Delfware, whatever you collect, the best of the best is in this house. And so the place is thronged flocked full of all of these different people. And the auctioneer arises to his podium and it's item number one. And it's a painting. The painting that used to hang above the fireplace. Now, you can be sure that the two dogs on either side of the mantelpiece would have been the real McCoy uh, in this house. But there was a picture that hung above the fireplace. Now, instead of displaying a young girl, this one displayed a young lad, two or three years of age. The young boy, perhaps on a rocking horse, in a sailor suit, Victorian boy. And the picture, amongst all of the fine artists of the day, hung this picture, signed by some obscure artist. It wasn't particularly pleasant to look at. It wasn't anything particularly special. But anyway, the auctioneer held up the painting and said, I'm going to begin with this item. And no doubt the people are saying, let's get on to the good stuff. But nonetheless, the auctioneer said, who will give me a thousand pounds for the painting? You could at least say that it once was able to hang in the great hall of this house. You could say that it once hung amongst the Van Goghs and the, the Michelangelos and the Da Vinci's and all of the other artists that, that um, adorned the walls of this great house. Nobody moved. 500 pounds, surely someone. 100 pounds, surely someone, not a mute, not, not a mute. All right, 50 pounds, 10 pounds, surely five pounds, a pound. Eventually, someone put up his number and said, a pound. Let's get this show on the road. And the auctioneer said, a pound, going once, going twice, sold, sold to the man there with the moustache and the peak cap. And then the auctioneer did something extraordinary. He said, that's the auction over. Well, there was uproar. There was people up on their feet. People were on chairs. What's going on? What about the crystal chandelier? What about the grandfather clock? What about the the silver candelabra. And the auctioneer said, the instructions were left that whoever bought this picture inherited everything, got everything, bought everything. Did you see the picture that hung above the fireplace was a picture of the baron's only son who died in infancy. That child was to be the inheritor of the vast estate. And that child died before he could inherit it. And the instruction was left that whoever bought the son got everything. Whoever thought enough of the son, whoever would cherish the son, had the right to the entire estate. House, grounds, livestock, the orchard, the salmon fishery, everything connected even to the house. 
all of the rights of ownership pass to the man prepared to pay a pound for the son. Well, you know what, folks? Doesn't it remind us of Scripture when it tells us that he that hath the son has everything? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, the Son of God, is the inheritor of all things. Paul tells us in Romans that we, the saved people of God, Christian people, are joint heirs with Christ. What a thought that all that Jesus inherits, we inherit as joint heirs with him. Why is that possible? It's possible through the Son. Scripture tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. At harvest time, isn't it good to think about the gifts from the ground? Isn't it good to think about the flowers that will adorn this place during the harvest weekend? Isn't it good to think about the things that you're about to tuck into? But all the more so, isn't it good to think about the greatest gift of all? God's Son, Jesus our Saviour, who you can trust in today. If you haven't placed your life into his hands, I urge you to today that you might experience what the psalmist says, that there's a table set before us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can inherit all that Christ inherits, the eternal life. The Gospels tell us that in God's house there are many mansions. That's your inheritance. That's what you look forward to. I trust that you've enjoyed your little box, and uh, there's a couple more musical items for you to enjoy just now. Cry in anger when 
thanks to everyone who's been involved, who have recorded themselves singing and playing music, to Johnny who did his little recording, to David who has ensured that the uh, video and the DVD is recorded and all edited and put together. And most sincerely thank you to those people who've been involved in the preparing of soup and wheat and bread and sweet treats. Thank you. Let's just pray to close. Father, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, help us to realize that we can experience the true gift of God by yielding our lives in submission to Christ. If we have, O oh Lord, how harvest is all the more sweeter. And we think not just of the earthly harvest, but when you return, Lord, and you gather us, the redeemed people of God, like sheaves onto yourself, and how we look forward to sharing in the great inheritance that really only you deserve, but yet you share it with us. Bless every person in their homes today. There are those, Lord, who haven't made it yet back to church. May they know that they're missed. May they know that we love them. May they know that we care for them. But this box and this DVD is a little indicator of that. Bless those, perhaps, who are sitting today and they have been awaiting hospital appointments, or they have loved ones who are awaiting hospital appointments, or perhaps they've recently been separated from their husband or their wife because one or other is in hospital or one or other have entered into full-time residential care. Whatever situation or circumstance each of us find ourselves in, may we realize that just like Boaz, who was the great redeemer, we have a true and better Boaz. We have the true and better redeemer. We have Jesus himself. Thank you that you're such a redeemer. Thank you that you're such a savior. And be with us. Draw close to us and those who we love. All for Jesus' sake. Amen. Mm -hmm. Gracious unto you.